Ephesians chapter 1. The book of Ephesians and the first chapter. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together, to to gather together with saints of like precious faith. Father, sometimes it it seems uh, it seems like we're just islands out there in the world, and and this uh, this this time that we have to come together is so precious to us, Father, for the fellowship and for the opportunity to look into your word, to sing your praises. And Father, we rely on your Holy Spirit to open our eyes and lighten our minds and hearts. And Father, we pray that you would do that for us. In the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, amen. (coughs) Ephesians and chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All right, now we've been in this verse for a couple of weeks now, and I've just got one one thing, that last uh, clause, phrase, in the, in the verse there, in Christ. Uh, I said to you when we started this study in Ephesians that the... Uh, This idea of being in Christ, you're going to see nearly 30 times in uh, in the book of Ephesians, and it's a it's a critical and and foundational theme through here. If you if you look, uh, verse three is not the first time. Verse one is written to the saints that are at Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. And you go and you go down uh, through the passage, and you see over and over again this idea of being in in Christ. And I, I'll mention to you, so we've been talking lately about Bible study and how to how to study your Bible and get get things out of your Bible. And if you go to your concordance or your computer program and you type in the phrase "in Christ." And you search the book of Ephesians, I believe, if memory serves, you're going to find that phrase probably about ten times. You say, well then how come you're saying it's almost thirty? Well, because I've mentioned to you before, and you know yourself, that when you when you search a phrase, you need to search related related phrases along with it. So you want to look at in Christ, you want to look for uh, in the Lord, you want to look for in Jesus Christ, you want to look for, one time Paul says the truth is in Jesus. He doesn't even include the word Christ. And then sometimes you get things that you might not think of when you're going through your head saying, okay, how many different ways can this be said and how many different ways do I have to look it up? As you go down through here, you see... um, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 6 and then verse 7, in whom? So that's one of those and you probably wouldn't think to to look up in whom when you were looking up in Christ. And it gets trickier than that if you look back up in verse 6, to the praise of his glory wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Well that's another one. And that's one that you probably wouldn't find just doing a concordance search. So how do you get all these? Well, there's only six chapters in the book of Ephesians. So what you do in a situation like that is read the book through. And 
with the express purpose, and you ought to read the book of Ephesians as many times as you can anyway, but read it through once and just pull out all those times that, that it talks about being in Christ, and that would be be profitable for you. So sometimes the concordance doesn't help you all that much when you're when you're doing your Bible study. Sometimes you got to sit down, take the 15, 20 minutes. It's only six chapters, and it'd be 15, 20 minutes of your life well spent. So Paul says we're blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And we've been talking about those that idea of spiritual blessings and we talked about heavenly places and what I want to talk with you about this morning now before we move from, from verse 3 is this idea of being in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? If you come back with me to 1 Corinthians and chapter 15, the end of the book of 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 15. The, um, the issue of being in Christ is compared in Paul's epistles to being in Adam, uh, uh, juxtaposed to, opposed to being in Adam. In the eyes of God, there are two types of people in the world. There are people who are in Adam, there are people who are in Christ, and that's all. God doesn't see any other any other distinctions. We're all, uh, we're all the same in the eyes of God within those two categories, in Adam or in Christ. What does it mean to be in Adam or in Christ? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, Paul says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So you see the difference there of being in Adam and being in Christ. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. So everyone in Adam is dead and on their way toward death. Everyone in Christ is alive and on their way toward life. So that's a difference that's worth, uh, that's worth noting. And you, uh, and you know where you want to be between those two things. You don't want to be in Adam. You want to be in Christ. The problem is, come come with me to back to Ephesians again, chapter two this time. The problem is that everyone is born into this world in Adam. Okay, what does that mean? That mean what that means is it has to do in part with our um, with our lineage you and I were in Adam when God created Adam you and I were in Adam at that time and we we are in Adam as we're born into this world every natural human being is a child of Adam so it has to do with that with that fathership. But it also what comes from that fathership is is our own individual nature. And we inherit our uh, our our genes that go that go beyond the physical body, our spiritual genes as it were. 
from our father. If our father is Adam, which it is as you're born into this world, then you inherit that nature. Ephesians chapter 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So you used to be in Adam, and in Adam all die. Then you got in Christ, and in Christ all are made alive. So you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked. So you were dead in sins and you were walking in sins. So there's an issue of your nature and then there's an issue of your behavior that follows your nature. And the nature is inherited from your father and the, and the behavior is inherited from your nature. So you're, you're born a sinner by nature, having done neither good nor bad in your life, you're born sinful. That's nature. Then when you grow up and you start to learn the difference between right and wrong, you do wrong. Now you're a sinner by your behavior. So now it's not just an inherited issue. Now it's a personal issue. And both of that, it comes in a chain. The nature comes from your father and the behavior comes from your nature. Wherein in time past you walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And that's the issue, disobedience. Are you obeying God or have you disobeyed God? Among whom we all, also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. See, this is an inner man and outer man issue. The flesh and the mind. Both of those things are are infected, as it were, by our being in Adam. The flesh and of the mind and were by nature, see, the children of wrath even as others. So being in Adam means that by our very nature, we are uh, the children of disobedience and therefore children of wrath. So that puts us in a bad spot uh, just by virtue of being born into this world. That's why the Lord told his folks, you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you need to be born again. Because the first time didn't work so good for you. So you need to get, you were born of Adam, you need to be born of the Spirit. You need to be born of God. You need a new nature. You need a new father. You need you need to be not in Adam, you need to be taken out of Adam. And you need to be put in to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, Come with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Because people have a problem with with this idea. How come we're being blamed for Adam's misbehavior? Adam sins. He lived 6,000 years ago. Never met the guy. Probably wouldn't like him if I did. And uh, and I'm being blamed for his, uh, for his antics, his disobedience. Well, you know... There's an issue in, 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 well, let's put it this way. For us, in the United States of America, and especially in the 21st century, we've got this thing, with this odd culture that we call, we, we call rugged individualism, right? It's what makes us Americans. And there's a lot of good about that, but the idea is that I'm not responsible for somebody else's behavior, okay? Now that's that's kind of a unique perspective on life. Throughout history and, and in many other parts of the world, there's a much closer connection to your 
to your family and your ancestry. And, and, and the father will tell the children, look, you bear my name. When you go out there, you represent me. See? And the father suffers for the sins of the child. And if the father's got a bad reputation, the child suffers for the sins of the father, right? And it, and it's a and it's a much we're we're, we're uh, more distant from each other in 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 American culture, especially modern, uh, than most than most cultures. For most places, this idea of being in your father in the way that we're talking about is not is not so foreign as it as it is to you and me. Uh, Hebrews chapter seven. Hebrews chapter 7 is talking about Melchizedek, the, the, the Psalm, uh, Psalm 110, Psalm of David, uh, says that Christ, the Messiah, is going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, of course, David was some 500 years after the law came along, so the law has been instituted in Israel, it's ensconced in the nation. It, 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 that's not like that was written before the law. And the, and the law has a priesthood. It's called the Levitical priesthood. And of the tribe of Levi, Levi especially the descendants of Aaron, the, the Aaronic priesthood. So you see a verse like that in the Psalms. Messiah is going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And you, and you go... Why after the order of Melchizedek? Why not after the order of Levi? After the order of Aaron? The way that Israel's priests are. So Hebrews 7 is answering that question. How that the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ supersedes, predates, uh, has preeminence over the Levitical priesthood. The priesthood of Melchizedek is a higher calling. Um... Yeah, verse 1, get it from the beginning. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, now this is back in, in, in Genesis uh, with, with Abraham, he met Melchizedek. He only show, Melchizedek shows up once in the Bible, three or four verses, and he's gone. Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. So Abraham gave a tithe to this Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God. First, being by interpretation, king of righteousness, that's what Melchizedek means. After that, also, King of Salem, that's who he was, which is king of peace. As you go down through Melchizedek, he starts looking a whole lot like the Lord Jesus Christ. You know? He's um, he's priest of the Most High God, receives a tithe from Abraham. He's king of righteousness. He's king of peace. Verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now there's arguments about whether Melchizedek was actually what we call a theophany, an appearance of Christ before Christ was born, or if he was just a type of Christ. Either way, the idea here is the guy, you know, when he says without descent, without father, without mother, without descent. I mean, if he was just, if he was a type of Christ, then he had a father and mother, unless he was the Lord himself. But what it's talking about there, you know, as you read through your Bible, every time you see, especially in the Old Testament, but in the New as well, when someone is introduced, they're introduced as the son of this one, the son of that one, the son of this one, the son of that one. And it takes, you know, it follows them like five, six and more generations through. And that's that. That's this idea that we're talking about, being in that, that patriarchal line. You are in that, your, that line. 
And, uh, and that's something that was very common. Um, any name that ends in, in S-O-N, Johnson, Thompson, Jameson, you know, that's all son of John, son of Tom, son of, that's, they're named. That's who I am. See? I am my lineage. So, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about being in Adam. You and I all come from Adam. So we're all, we were all in Adam uh, when he was created. Reading on. Now consider how great, verse 4, this man was, unto whom even the patriarch, that's important here, the patriarch, that's the father, Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So the, the, the Levites take tithes under the Levitical priesthood. The rest of the children of Israel give their tenth of their goods to the tribe of Levi for the priesthood. But he whose descent is not counted from them, Melchizedek, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So Melchizedek is what that's saying is Melchizedek is better than Abraham. Melchizedek is higher than Abraham because Abraham paid him tithes and he blessed Abraham. And the blessing you don't go you don't go uphill with the blessings. The blessing goes down. The bless the 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 less is blessed of the better. And here men die that receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. So Melchizedek never died as far as the record goes. Again, he shows up, does that thing he does with Abraham, talks to him, blesses him, receives the tithes, and then he goes away and you never see him again. And as I may so say, watch now, this is why we're here, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father, when Melchizedek met him. See, Levi is counted here, and Levi stands for the priesthood of Israel. Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. Now, Levi wasn't born yet when Abraham paid that tithe to Melchizedek, but he was in the loins of his father. Therefore, because Abraham did it, Levi did it. So the same idea holds for you and me when it comes to being in Adam. Adam did it, therefore we did it. And if that bothers you too much, I'll remind you that your nature is only a part of it. Because you say, okay, someone's born into this world sinners, does that mean that if a baby dies they go to hell? No, it doesn't. Because there's such a thing as, as accountability in an age where that accountability happens. And that age is when you know the difference between good and evil and you choose evil. Then it goes beyond your nature and then your behavior becomes a factor. And you're judged not just for being in Adam, but for being a sinner in your own right. Now that, here... Come come back with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12 is the calling out of Abraham. Genesis 12, you know where Genesis 12 comes in your Bible? Right after Genesis 11. Isn't that funny? That's, uh, that's quite a coincidence. Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel. 
Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, is when all the nations of the earth, all the people of the earth, are scattered. The languages are confused, and the people are scattered over the face of the whole earth. That's back in 11, uh, 9. The name of it is called Babel. The Lord did there confound the languages of the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So it's on the heels of that event that God calls. He he scatters the people from that Tower of Babel. Paul describes it in Romans chapter 1 as God turning, turning his back, turning away from all the world. They didn't want him. They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. They got vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. All of that stuff. And and God gives, gives them up at the Tower of Babel. Then he turns right around and he calls out Abraham. Chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So what, what God is doing with Abraham is he's taking him out of his, his father. He's taking him out of his father's house, out of his father's land. He's separating him from that, uh, from that lineage, as it were, spiritually so. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, watch, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So you say, well, all people of the earth are cursed because they're in Adam. Well, in Abraham... All those nations are going to be blessed. Uh, That's talking about in the kingdom and then on out through eternity. So there's that issue again of identification being, in this case, in Abram. Now come back with me to chapter 1, Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. So all the families of the earth are blessed in Abram. Why? Well, if we had gone a little bit further on in Genesis 17, you find out that God, when God changes Abram's name to Abraham, he does that. Because Abram means father. Abraham means the father of many the father of nations. And he says, A father of many nations have I made thee. And it's through that fatherhood relationship, that patriarchal relationship, all nations now are in Abraham. Because in Abraham receives the blessing from God, and in him all the nations of the earth are blessed and he becomes the father of many nations so that that issue of identification there for blessing or for curse uh, comes in now Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 we all know this passage and God said let us make man in our image after our likeness And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So Adam is a direct creation of God, and as such he bears the image of God. God, that's what it means that God made man in his own image. Adam is a direct creation of God. Now what that means, if you, well, here, hold hold this, look in chapter 5 real quick. In between chapter 1 and chapter 5, you got chapter 3. That's another coincidence in, in Genesis. Chapter 3 
is the fall. Adam eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil after God commanded him not to. And by one man, sin enters the world. And that image of God there at that point is it becomes marred. And now Adam bears a different image. He's got a, diff- a new nature now. That what you and I call the old nature. The nature we inherited from Adam. That nature that made us by nature the children of wrath. So, when Adam has a kid, in uh, chapter 5, three, verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. So, when Adam starts having kids, they're not born in the image of God. They're born in the image of Adam. You're, you're, you're born in the image of your father. That's why Adam was created in God's image. Because God created him. God was his father. Now, as you go down through back in verse uh, chapter 1 again, you know... These verses, verse 28, just the first part of verse 28, God blessed them after he created them in his own image, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. So that's what you see Adam and Eve doing in, in beginning in chapter 4 with Cain and Abel, and then chapter 5 with Seth. They're multiplying. What are they multiplying? Well, they're multiplying themselves. That's what you multiply, right? So a bunch of little atoms, little leaves running all around. Little little copies of Adam and Eve, see? There, he's multiplying himself. So when he has kids, they're born in his image. In Adam's image. And that goes down, 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 down the line all the way to you and to me. When we're born into this world, we're born in Adam. Now, that that verse there in chapter 1, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. You take that verse, and what you know what happens in, in chapter 3, when they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they and that causes the fall, their own personal fall and the fall of the whole human race with them in them. And compare that, come with me to Colossians chapter three. Because here's where you and I come in. You want to get this. Colossians chapter three. How do we get um, how do we get taken out of Adam? When you were saved, you were taken out of Adam and you were put into Christ. Now the way that that happened was by baptism. But how is God able to do that? How is God able to change your nature like that? To actually take you out of your father and put you in with a new father? How does that happen? Colossians chapter 3. It happens very much the same way he created Adam to start with. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. There again, that nature behavior issue. The old man, that's your nature. With his deeds, that's the behavior and have put on the new man watch which is renewed in knowledge not from the knowledge of good and evil from that tree but renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him so you want to get those two verses Genesis 1 27 Colossians 3 10 and keep those together in your mind because that's how you became a child of God 
Come back with me to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. I know we're running today. That's all right. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 is all about lineage. The lineage of Jesus Christ. All the way back to Adam. You and I are are essentially what Adam was in the sense of, of this fatherhood issue. We're new creatures. You know, Adam was a new creature. God, when God made Adam, there was no creature ever like him before. All the angels were there. They didn't look anything like Adam. They weren't made in the image of God. God had already made all the animals earlier on the same day. None of them looked like God. God created man in his own image. A new creature. A new kind of of, of being. When you got saved, you were made a new creature. A new kind of being. Now, you're different from Adam, and we'll get that in here if we can, in a lot of ways, in important ways. But this idea of how you got there to start with, it's the same way Adam got there. You were created in the image of God. Renewed in knowledge. Get rid of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all the effects of that. You're renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created your new man. So you're a new you're you're newly created. That's different. There's a difference between that and being born again. See, when you're born, we were born from Adam. When you're born, that's not a creation, that's a procreation. The, 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 the people who are born of Adam, here, Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, we're following the lineage of Jesus Christ all the way down through, uh, beginning, with, and, and it runs it backwards. If you start in verse 23, or get verse 23, we're not going to read the whole thing. Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which is the son of Heli, which is the son of Mephat, and it goes down, down, all the way down, the next several, all the way to the end of the chapter. So it runs backward, 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 and all these fathers' names. Verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. You see that? Adam was the son of God. None of these, all these other people are the son of their father. But God was Adam's father. So Adam was the son of God. Now, there were some other sons of God back there in Genesis, and they already existed before Adam. They were angels, are called the sons of God. Now, what does Adam have in, in common with angels? They're all directly created. Angels are not procreated. Every single angel of the thousands and millions upon millions of angels, every one was directly created by the hand of God. Therefore, every one is a son of God. Adam is the son of God because he is a direct creation of the hand of God. You are a child of God for the exact same reason. Because you've been created. Created anew. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Don't know anybody in Adam. We don't know each other in Adam. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. There, now that's a, you know, Christ is, is 
was there at the top of that lineage leading down to Adam, right? Christ was the child of Adam. Now, he wasn't the child of Joseph, therefore there's a break there in the line and that's why he was born sinless because he didn't inherit that nature. But he was the son of Adam. Well, we don't know. He was also the son of David, the son of Abraham. But we don't know him by any of those ways anymore because there's something new going on now. We don't know. We used to know Christ after the flesh, but now and henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, and that's what we're talking about, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. So, you're no longer a child of Adam. You're no longer in Adam. You are a new creature, directly from the hand of God, and that creation, come back to Ephesians chapter 2, is in Christ. That's why you need to be in Christ. Because who is the Son of God? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. All these others are sons of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. See, that's where you and I, we kind of diverge from Adam. He was created from the hand of God and became one of the sons of God. You and I are in Christ. We're in the Son of God. Ephesians chapter 2. We know the verses, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're not you're you're saved by the grace of God. Your salvation is a gift. It's a gift you require by faith. You know what faith is? Faith is the only thing you can do without doing anything. There's no works involved in your salvation. It does it doesn't have to do with your uh with your old nature, your old behavior, or 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 anything else. It's got to do with the gift that God offers to you and you receive by faith. Why? So that no one can boast. No one can get to heaven and say, I'm here because I was good. For we are his workmanship, watch it, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You and I are created. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We're created in Christ. That's where the new the new creature is. We're out of time. Come come with me. Come with me to First Corinthians fifteen again. When Paul says we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, everything that you have, everything that you and I have from God, all spiritual blessings. We have by virtue of being in His Son. When God looks at you, He sees His Son. Because you are in Him. That means that to the Father, you look like the Lord Jesus Christ. When He sees you, He sees His Son. Paul says that Christ offered himself a sweet smelling savor to God. He also says that we are a sweet savor of Christ unto God. So you don't just look like Christ, you smell like him. Paul says that we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us. What Spirit? The Spirit of the Son of God makes intercession for us and the Father that knows the hearts knows what is the the mind of the Spirit 
And the Spirit prays for us when we're praying. The Spirit of His Son. That means that you sound like His Son to Him. You look like Him. You sound like Him. You smell like Him. As far as He's concerned, you're Him. Because you're in Him. That's what it means to be in Christ. See, that's different than what Adam had. That's, that's, that, that's different. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Oh, Paul's talking about the resurrection body, body here, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, that's Christ was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, those that are in Adam, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. See? You're taken out of Adam, and you're placed into Christ. You're given that image by, by virtue of your creation when you got saved. That's the inner man you will come to bear that image in the outer man when when we get to what Paul is talking about here, the resurrection of the body. You will not only be ch- children, sons of God, you will appear as sons of God. Once you get that resurrection body, then the, the transformation to his image will be complete. You'll still look like you. We won't all look like Jesus Christ running around a bunch of clones. But uh, but you're going to bear the image of the heavenly in that resurrection body. Now, we talked about being in Christ and being in Adam, and we didn't even look at Romans chapter 5. And Romans 5 is the primary passage on that. So I'll let that, I'll let that be for you to do. Uh, read through Romans 5 beginning in verse 12 and and down and Paul talks all about it all about how by one man's offense many were made sinners and by the righteousness of one by one man's obedience many were made righteous you've been made righteous in Christ you were made a sinner in Adam but you've been made righteous in Christ just like now Just like your behavior followed your nature, then let your behavior follow your nature now. You've been given a new nature. Has it done anything to your behavior? Have you changed the way you live? Your old nature dictated your old behavior. Your new nature ought to to affect you new behavior. We'll leave it there. Do you have a question? Comment? Any further word? Yeah, Rich. So, so it came to me when you said that God created the angels. That means he created Satan. Yeah. So when Satan said, I want to be like you, or I want to be you, not only did it make him mad, obviously, but it like hurt his feelings. It was, it was, it was a betrayal. So maybe this is why God has even more patience than we can't imagine. He's already been through about as much as he's going to with Lucifer. Yes. That, yeah, that, well, that's a good point, you know. If, if you study that, the fall of Lucifer, what you find out back there in the prophets, and I couldn't find it for you right now, I could give it to you next week if I had the chance, but there was tremendous mourning throughout the universe when Lucifer fell including God, there was a funeral to top all funerals. Uh, 
when Lucifer fell. It was not, you know, yeah, nice to know you, good riddance. That was huge. And it was personal for God and for the angels. All right. Thanks, you.